Well, welcome to today's webinar on teaching multivariate methods, uh, specifically clustering and principal component analysis. Um, one of our academic ambassadors, uh, Vocal Craft from Germany, is going to be delivering the webinar today. Uh, there is a poll that you should see asking about software use. We always like to know how many folks are using Jump or if there's other software uh, you are using. So if you see that poll, um, really appreciate it if you can answer that question. Now, there's both a chat window and a Q&A window. Um, if you have a question, it is best that you put it in the Q&A window. That'll be easy or for us to monitor the questions and answer them. If you have just a general comment you want to make, it's not uh, a question per se, then you know you can you can certainly make a comment in the chat, but try to focus your questions um, in the Q and A um, window. Um, with that, um, Volker, are you ready to go? Thank you, Kevin, and welcome everyone to this multivariate methods webinar and let me start to share some comments about the topic i think we we all agree on first is re if you think about real world problems 99 percent of them are multivariate so you have to understand and probably analyze multiple variables and more complex relationships. And with these more complex problems, you typically also end up with more complex solutions. So also communicating these solutions, maybe to a na uh, naive audience, can be challenging. And here jump comes in very handy with all the graphical outputs you will also see today. And the third comment is about the main topic today, or the main, let's say, the main statistical topic today, collinearity. And this is really fundamental. Every student, so all scientists, all engineers should be aware. They should be able to assess collinearity in their data and also to attack the problem and to manage collinearity to reduce it or maybe even to um, remove it from the data. Yeah, with design of experiments, also in JUMP, um, this is built into the design. Yeah? Every design tool has a color map showing the correlation collinearity between effects, yeah? which could be a problem if it would be there, but it helps you to, to minimize the problem and the software helps you. But what if you are not that lucky, if you are not analyzing experimental data, but observed and typically messy data. So in this case, you have to be aware and every data analyst should be aware and prepared to, to tackle the problem. And so for predictive modeling, everyone knows about overfitting or sh should know about overfitting and how to uh, protect against it using validation. Here it's also the, the same type of enemies, collinearity in any modeling. It would be a problem in, in, in any, any modeling, not just predictive modeling. So what are the applications we, we are also addressing today? If you have hundreds of thousands of variables, you may want to or maybe need to reduce the dimensionality of your data. And the main method to do this is a principal component analysis. And that's one of the methods we will see today. Uh, and typically, we are thinking about one group of variables. So this would be unsupervised 
machine learning, but it can also be used and enhance your supervised machine learning scenarios. Yeah, so principal component analysis can also be used as a preparation step before you build a regression model to improve the accuracy of your model. Yeah, and we will also see this. So we are not just looking at the univari uh, the, the unsupervised case. We are also looking at some, some modeling um, problems and modeling steps. And we will see how PCA can also help here. And identifying patterns, typically it's not enough to look at one or two variables. You have to look at the big picture. Yeah? And the second methods we will see today is clustering. Yeah? And clustering can really help you to, to identify and see the patterns in your data. Again, this can be unsupervised, just analyzing, looking at one group of variables, but you can also use it um, and get some benefits for your modeling um, problems. So if you are able to map, sorry, if you are able to um, map many variables just to a cluster ID, which represents the original data, or if you are able to identify multivariate outliers before you build a model, that would be helpful. So what are we doing today? So two weeks ago, we already had a first um, webinar presented by my colleague um, Kevin about multivariate thinking, especially for introductory statistics courses. And this webinar, the recording is available in our user community. So you see here, so you can watch it if you uh, didn't attend and also get the journal Kevin used. Today, we will look at the two key methods, PCA, principal components and clustering. And we will also look at the problem of collinearity and correlation analysis in JUMP. Yeah, and for all of these topics, I would like to show you um, how to demonstrate the, the why and the how typically to a student audience. Yeah, I won't explain all the technical details and statistical details of these methods. So I, I'm assuming that you are uh, aware of, of the, the, the basic ideas here. Um, but how to demonstrate this to students? And then also how to get a student started with one of these methods. And I will also point you to some further case studies, maybe for exercises and more practice and where the students can learn more and dive deeper into the topics. And as a, um, a just an announcement, in two weeks, we will have another um, webinar also addressing multivariate methods. And that one will look at factor analysis and structural equation modeling. So let's start with <clears throat> the first um, topic, collinearity. Uh, and that happens when we have linear relationships, also known as correlation, among our variables. Uh, and as I said, this can be just in one group of variables, unsupervised, or if we are talking about model building, uh, so and a supervised scenario, then we would consider the predictor variables here. So collin collinearity in, in the predictor variables. That can really harm your regression models. What's the problem? It's inflating the variance. Uh, and the variance on both sides, if you are building a model, it's um, less accuracy on both sides, the predicted response and the estimated model parameters. And so this can really be a problem and it can be addressed by looking at the multivariate 
platform in Jump just to detect and assess correlation. So that's a, a good idea, yeah? And also distribution fit Y by X. So that's for univariate and bivariate analysis. They are always helpful, not the topic today. They are always helpful, but they cannot provide the big picture. Yeah, so we will look deeper <laughs> into the analyze menu where we will find the multivariate methods yeah, you know, like multivariate for correlation analysis, principal components, and we will also look at clustering methods later on. And also fit model is a multivariate methods method if you have more predictors than just one, and that's the typical case. Yeah, you know, it's a multivariate problem. The good news is that you don't need to check your data using the multivariate first. It's a good idea to do this, but if you don't do this, there are also many pointers and alarms in the fit model output. And we will also look at this. So what's the problem in, in fitting models with collinear data? And we want to see how to demonstrate this to students. And for that, we will start with a very small data set, a, a simple problem. And this is just um, using two predictors, x1 and x2. And we use these two and the response y to build a multiple regression models with these two axes, just explaining or predicting the outcome y. Yeah, and I just run this script here, which is added to the data set to, to, to save a bit of time. Um, but what we did here, I can show you how this was started, relaunch this analysis. So the analysis used the fit model platform, yeah, and we have the Y as the response, and we have our two predictors in here, and that's it. Yeah, and then we get the output we see here. So great to see an R squared of 99%. The standard deviation of the error is, is reasonable. The overall model is, is significant. So that's the whole model test here, the analysis of variance. We see significance. We also see significance for both parameter estimates, the interesting ones, x1 and x2. Yeah, so what is the problem? Yeah, so the problem is that the user, in our case, the student, can be really puzzled looking at the data using the graph builder. Yeah, because with graph builder, we can easily look at the relationships between y and x1 and also y and x2. Yeah, and what do we see here? we see a positive slope for the X1 relationship. Yeah, and that makes sense because we also have a, a positive um, parameter estimate for X1. But we also have an even bigger estimate for X2, also positive. But if you look at the graph builder, this one is negative. So, what's happening, what's what's true. Now, so the difference is that in Graph Builder, we are just looking at two bivariate relationships. Now, and if you just look at Y versus X2, you would see this negative trend. But here we have a multivariate setup. So here we look at the influence, the effect of X1 
with also having X2 in the model. And we are looking at X2 also having X1 in the model. Uh, so it's a different situation. It's, it's a, a, um, a different um, analysis and, and context. But these results are really, really different. Yeah, the opposite direction. Yeah, and the reason for this is, can be seen if we use the multivariate platform and look at correlation. Yeah, and here we have a correlation map between all our variables. And, and the interesting coefficient is this one here. So that's the correlation between our predictors x1 and x2. And they are highly correlated. Uh, so if we look at the scatter plot matrix, again, pairwise scatter plots. So pairwise, that means this one here is the same as what we saw in Graph Builder. Yeah, but we also see a strong negative correlation yeah, between X1 and X2. And that means that in our model, there the two factors or predictors which are working together. So they can support each other or they can fight against each other. It, it depends. So if it's negative, so, so they are fighting against um, each other. Yeah, and this changes the situation. Yeah, it makes it maybe a bit tricky and sometimes confusing to, to, to understand this, but the main drawback is probably that the variance is inflated. And the variance is what we see here as a standard error for our estimates. Yeah, so this standard error gets higher and higher if we have more and more collinearity in our data. So this is just an introduction um, to, to, to using a small problem, looking at a, a bigger problem. So here we have a similar situation, but in this case, we have 14 predictors, 14 axes, and we have again a response. Uh, and we, we could start the same way using fit model to build a model, in this case, more access, 14. And again, no problems so far. If we just look at this, what is the, the, the standard output, the, the parameter estimates. Yeah, what I already did, and that's on request, so to say, is this column here. Yeah, and this is a numeric um, diagnostic about collinearity. And it's called a variance inflation factor. And this is based on an R squared. And we see we have an R squared here, which is not that bad, uh, almost 70%. It's, it's not that bad, but this is a different one. It's called the variance inflation factor. Uh, and here we have an R squared, which is a regression of one predictor on all other predictors. So how much of the variation in X11 can be explained by all other axes? A lot. Yeah, so we have this variance inflation factor of 63. Yeah, and if you look at <clears throat> this formula here, so that means that the R squared is, is really high. Yeah, and high means if the R squared would be 80%, we would get an VIF of five. 
if the R squared is 90%, the VIF is 10. So five to 10, that's the, the normal range when you start to, to see an alarm here, to, to, to get a warning. Yeah, and there's a clear warning here because we, we I, I sorted the parameter estimates by VIF and mo all of them are above five. Yeah, an R squared of 80%. So we have a lot of variation here and that's one way to detect it, the VIF. Yeah, another way to see the variation is by looking at leverage plots. Yeah, and here it's about the spread of our data points. Yeah, and if the spread is really shrunk and small, it's more and more difficult to fit this line. It becomes more and more unstable. Yeah, to fit a line to our data cloud, which is shrunk on the x axis. Yeah, so the leverage plots really, really help here as well. And if you look at X11, that's the, the highest VIF, we see that this spread is really, really um, limited. And we also see this at the confidence interval for the predicted um, line, for the red line. So this is really broad. So we, we cannot really tell about um, what we see on the profiler. Yeah, so here we also have the confidence bands, the 95% confidence band for, for the fit. And if we switch extrapolation control on, you see, oh, it's really, really bad. So we cannot tell... A, um, about many ranges, the outer ranges of our predictors, because we have no data there. Uh, we have no data. So it's really hard to, 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 to come up with a, a good model in this case. So if you want to get students started uh, with this topic, I would like to refer you to the learning library. Maybe we will see an example later on. We also have teaching demos, for instance, the one about culinarity. So if we go to the sample index and switch to tools, this is demo culinarity. So this one here, it's a script. I can run the script and then set up the problem here, and then we see this <clears throat> interactive demonstration, yeah? and we see the, the correlation, and we also see the variance inflation factors on leverage plots here. And if I increase the correlation between the two predictors, you see that the variance inflation factor goes up and the problem becomes more and more challenging. Yeah, can, you can also export the data, fit a model, and analyze the full problem. It's a demonstrator, but it can be really used to experience such a situation. We also have case studies. So here it's um, a case study 24. If you look at our case study library, uh, so the case study 24 <clears throat> about housing prices. So this also covers um, correlation and multicollinearity, as you can see here on, on our webpage. And there's even more to, you can um, share with students to learn about the concepts. And one pointer is to the documentation, of course, and the other pointer is to our statistical thinking course. Um, let me see where we have this one. Yeah, here it is. So statistical thinking for industrial problem solving steps for short. And this is a correlation and regression course. And you see it also covers correlation and multicollinearity um, as an e-learning resource. So what can we do? So we 
are now aware, we assessed the culinarity. So what can we do against it? And if we look again at our smaller problem, this one, this one here, uh, I can visualize the data using a scatter plot 3D all three dimensions, including the response. And then we see our data points. And even better, if I change the settings a bit. Yeah, so now we see the data points in, in a three-dimensional space. And if we look at um, the x1, x2, two-dimensional space, we will see you, We see that the data are not really spread all over the place here. That would make it easier to fit a plane to our data. Uh, but here the data are more arranged on, on a line. Yeah? And that makes it really challenging to, to land a plane on this data cloud. It's not a cloud, actually. It's, it's a line. Yeah, so what can we do? Yeah, we map this data to a new access system. And these are our principal components. These are new variables, new access. Yeah, and the first principal component goes to uh, the direction where we see the highest variability in our data. And this is really clear in this low dimension um, example here. So we see where everything happens along this line. So that would be our first principal component. The second would take the second place, biggest variability, but perpendicular to the first principal component. And so on and so on. If we have more than two variables, we can have more and more principal components. Yeah, and this is what we saw looking at the simple problem. Let's get back to, to the problem with our 14 predictors. Yeah, so here to get the principal components for this case, we would choose analyze multivariate methods principal components. It's quite straightforward. I take all my predictors, not the response. It's called Y here. Uh, don't be confused. These are just the predictors. I want to transform into a new access system. Uh, and I just take the defaults and click OK. And here we are with the first output. So we see that just the first principal component explains almost 30% of the variation in our data. Yeah, and you see the details here. So this is the two-dimensional space, the first two principal components. And the first explains most of the variation, almost 30%. The second adds another 18%. Yeah, and this is called a score plot. So we see our data points, the same data again, but mapped from the x1, x2, x3, and so on space to the principal component space. And from that space, here we see just the first two dimensions, which are the most important ones. So if we um, look at the eigenvalues here with some more detail, we see that the first two explain 46% of the variation. Yeah, and if we just take half of the dimensions, just seven principal components from 14 predictors, half of the dimensions, we explain over 90% of the variability in our data. So that's a good win. Yeah, that's a good win. So that also means we maybe don't need all of our principal components. They are ranked. 
And that's not the case with our predictor variables. They are in any order we don't know, but with the principal components, we know they are ranked the most important one, the most interesting one comes first. Now this is a loading plot and you can add a lot of other information um, to this analysis. You can also look at the loading matrix and maybe in some cases you can also interpret the loadings. So if you see that the principal component is maybe loaded by two call uh, two related predictors, you can maybe explain what's happening on the principal component six dimension. Yeah, so you may also find some underlying or latent variables by looking at this. But finally, what we can do here is we can save the principal components to our data set. And I save all of them, you know, also the least important ones, all 14 principal components to our data set. And now they are available here in a column group, principal components. Uh, and we still have, oops, that's not the one. So we are here. We still have this model using our predictors, right? So now I built the same model. Let's go relaunch this analysis again, but I remove all the predictors and take the principal components in here. Yeah, remember, same data, no worries, just a different access system. And I run this analysis. I put it side to side. Let me, yeah, move this. So now we see, oh, what's the difference? So we see the same R squared. So if you compare these, these two numbers. Now we also see the same root mean square error. We see the same F ratio. Uh, and of course the parameters are different because here we are looking at the principal components. What's, what changed? Uh, let's add the variance inflation factor. It's a right click on the parameter estimates table and then add VIF. Yeah, so that's also what I did on, on the left-hand side, the standard model. And we see variance inflation factor one. Yeah, and if you go back to our formula, that means that there's no correlation. Yeah, so principal components are orthogonal, independent. There's no correlation. Yeah, and then one divided by one is one. And these are the ones we want to see. Perfect. Another adva advantage is that the standard errors are small. Yeah, so we don't have inflated variance anymore. And if the standard errors are small, the noise is small. So the signal to noise, our T ratio is higher. And that means that the P value get smaller. So we should be able to better find active effects and predictors. So we get a higher power by our model. Yeah? And if you see on the left-hand side, we just have one, two, three, four um, significant effects but we may miss some effects which are significant or active, but we don't see it because the variance is inflated. And that's the problem again and again. That's the problem. Yeah, also on this side, we can look at the leverage plots 
by adding the diagnostics, the fact leverage. So now you see the data points are really spread all over the X axis. So that's nice. Uh, and if we look at a profiler, vector profiling profiler, yeah, you see the confidence bands are much smaller. Uh, so we get a much higher confidence on our predicted slopes here. Yeah, so that's all nice. And, and if we add extrapolation control, so just for comparison purposes, yeah, also this looks much better. So we don't have a warning <laughs> that just goes on and on because we don't have any data in that region. No, we have. We, we, we know everything much better using the principal components. So that's all good. But a student may ask you, hey, <laughs> dear professor, what did I learn just looking at the principal components? I, I cannot imagine what this is telling me. Yeah, so now just closing the loop, what you can do from this model here, the principal component model, is we can save the prediction formula and we can also save, save columns, the standard error prediction formula. Yeah, and then I take the profiler from the graph menu I choose these two formulas and important, expand the intermediate formulas because these are the principal component formulas which have all the access inside. I want to make them visible. What's inside in my formula, I want to show this and I want to see the access instead of the principal components. And I also say yes. So to use the second one as a confidence interval. Yeah, and this is this is what we what we see here. Um, so that's the way how to visualize um, the profiler using axis uh, and the principal components. Also, if we just use less components. And this is an example for dimension reduction. Yeah, so we can remove some of the principal components, yeah, the least important ones also here. And because they are independent, I can grab them all and remove them from the model. Yeah, and if we would do the same again and export to the profiler, we would also see all the access probably because just a smaller number of principal components uses all the access and we can see the relationships. Okay. Again, get the students started using principal components. So if the student asks you, okay, let me do this in jump. So where do I find this platform to do this and how to get started? first time using doing a principal component analysis, then it's time to use our learning library. These are one page guides, short videos. Yeah, so for multivariate methods, principal components, so more than 100 um, typical statistical methods um, are shown here. And there should be a video which is just not showing right now. Um, you should be able to, to, to see it. And this is the page, the single page explaining what it is very briefly, then how to start doing this using a sample data set built into the software, how to interpret the results and where to learn more. Yeah, so this is just one guide for principal components and there are 100 more in the learning library. 
we also have uh, case studies and there is a, a case study um, cluster analysis in the public sector. And I can just give you an idea if I need it. Let's see, this is, yep. Here it is. So this is one of our case studies you can find in the case study library. Yeah, and this has been created by Professor Carver uh, from the US. And this is about cluster analysis in the public sector, but it also uses principal component analysis. Uh, it's about Massachusetts and it describes the problem and all the data. Yeah, you can also download the data set together with this PDF. And then it shows you how to explore the data, how to do a principal component analysis and explains everything step by step and what we learn here. And there's also cluster analysis um, as a second step. And then at the end, you have some learning outcomes being discussed at the very end, which is here, and some additional exercises. Just an example for a case study. Uh, and also here we have more to offer to for a deep dive into principal components. Uh, there's a webinar which is linked here and you can download the journal I'm showing here uh, when we published the recorded webinar. So you can get the journal there and, and have a look at the webinar or go to the documentation. There's also an example in the step-by-step -step, uh, procedure in our documentation. The second topic, or let's say the second method, because the main topic was really collinearity. The second multivariate method um, I want to show you is clustering. Yeah? And clustering in, in the unsupervised case is really grouping the observations, the rows in our data. Yeah, and we group similar observations together <clears throat> step by step. And that creates a natural grouping. Yeah, and for example, Netflix can use this if they know that you watched a certain movie, they can tell, oh, you may be also interested in this movie and this movie because <clears throat> they typically belong to the same cluster. They are similar somehow. Now, this is all unsupervised so far. <clears throat> if you use this in a supervised setup, then it's about classification. If you want to assign observations to predefined categories, maybe a spam filter has to check each email. Is it spam or not spam? Yeah, and that's a, a different story we are not covering here, but that's maybe a discriminant analysis. Yeah, so this is an analysis where you have categorical outputs, responses. And there's for clustering also a special clustering. So this clusters variables. So that's the other way to use clustering. I meant I said clustering is about grouping observations yeah? and all the clustering methods do this, except this one cluster variables. And that can also be used for variable selection. So you can get groups of variables and then maybe just pick the most representative variable per group per cluster yeah? and just remove all the other ones. This could all, this is maybe an alternative to, to principal component analysis, um, quite easy to use. Yeah, and if we look at that link, so this is the documentation. It also introduces all the ways to, to cluster observations. And there's also an overview here, which is quite helpful. 
So we will just look at hierarchical clustering today and k-means <coughs> clustering. The advantage of k-means is that you can really use bigger data sets, millions of rows. Now, so with hierarchical clustering, there's a limit, maybe a few 10,000 of observations with a fast hybrid algorithm, you, you can stretch that limit, but there's a limit. Yeah, And k-means allows you also to, to uh, analyze um, genomic data or uh, we will see an example in a minute. So how to um, demonstrate the why and the how to students. So here I have uh, the World Happiness data from the report this year, 2024. And the last year, which is in the data is 2023. So we are looking at more than 100 countries in this case um, for this year only. Now, this data can be um, downloaded as an Excel spreadsheet. And then it's an easy step to, to get it into Jump. And then I used the data filter to just extract uh, the data for the previous year. Yeah, the life letter, that's the main thing on a zero to 10 scale, um, all the people are asked, how do you judge the quality of your life on a scale from zero to 10? And that's the, the summary um, overall result. But there are also six factors driving this quality of life. And these are the factors you also see here. So we have six variables with continuous um, with continuous data. Yeah, and now it's easy to do some clustering if you are interested to see which countries are going together. Um, we can analyze clustering and then use hierarchical cluster. Uh, and here I just take the six factors into my columns role and I use the country name to label the observations. Now we just have a single observation per country because we only have data for a single year. 2023 and that's it. So we can label by country. And here we can also select other methods to compute the distances. So this algorithm here, it will start by treating each country as a cluster with a single observation. Each cluster has a single observation. And then the algorithm combines the two closest, most similar clusters, in this case, <laughs> two observations. Yeah? And then it has a cluster with two, and then it looks for the next cluster, which can be combined and added, or the next two clusters, which have the smallest distance. And how to calculate the distance? So here the default is the ward, algorithm. Yeah, so here we see that this uses a minimum variance in the joint cluster. That's the criterion which is used how to calculate the similarity or distance. Yeah, and just keeping the defaults, this is the result here. It's a good idea to color the clusters this side. Good idea to, to color the clusters. Yeah? And the clustering process doing this is from the left to the right. Yeah? So the smallest distance, the distances are indicated by the horizontal lines. Yeah? And the smallest horizontal line, that's the first combination. 
Uh, and then more and more countries are grouped together. And then at the end, you just have one bucket with all the countries. Uh, I could also come from the right-hand side and start to, to split the countries in two groups, three groups, and so on. This is not, not how the algorithm works, but it, it can um, be also interesting to, to do this. So if we use the graph builder to watch this, yeah, so now we have all the countries in one cluster. And now moving to the left, we see red and green two clusters. Yeah, and then a third cluster and so on and so on. And then you can also monitor if the clustering, the split makes sense geographically. Um, yeah, and then you can also select the number of clusters based on the map, the mapping. You can also look at this distance plot down here. Yeah, so the first groupings have very small distances and then the distance gets bigger and bigger. And then maybe at some time when it in the elbow or before the elbow comes up, you may, may want to stop. Yeah, and I can also set the number of clusters maybe to, to 20 and then okay. I can zoom in and see what we what we have here. Yeah, so we have Bangladesh and Morocco in one cluster. Um, we also have France and Spain in one cluster. Yeah, and if you know the report, where are the, the happy ones? This one here, the, the pink one, yeah, Denmark, Norway, Finland. Um, so, so these are typically the winners <laughs> in happiness the most um, happiest countries. Yeah? And we see that they are also clustered together. Yeah? A lot of information we can, we can see here and add to this dendrogram. So that's the name of this tree output. Now we can also look at, at summaries, cluster summaries to see the mean and the standard deviation per cluster. Maybe more interesting is to look at a constellation plot. So this is just a, an alternative representation, alternative to the dendrogram. And then these are maybe like little stars on the sky. And the distances are also shown by the distances of these connectors. So that's called a constellation plot. This is really helpful also for, for exploratory data analysis and find patterns in your data. Now we can look at a scatter plot matrix and then we see on pairwise scatter plots where we have the clusters. Yeah, and then we see that in which dimensions some clusters are really popping out. And we, so the, the purple one here in, in, in this um, corruption and GDP space, the purple ones have a very high GDP and a very low perception of corruption. So, and these are the happy, the happy countries. We can also see maybe potential outliers, Afghanistan here, or here we have Afghanistan as well. So we can also get some um, pointers for, for outliers. Uh, and then at, at the end, we could save the clusters for further analysis. And save the clusters means that we are saving the cluster assignment, the result, to our data table. Yeah, and that's the result here. So we have 20 clusters uh, and we get a, a nominal column with the cluster information. Yeah, and we can use this 
for modeling. Maybe we can now use the cluster information as a predictor instead of the six um, variables um, we used for clustering. Um, clustering information is categorical, so they be, that's maybe not that much of a win, but it can be very useful. Yeah, and we can also use it for further analysis. So I can take the graph builder and then we can look at maybe the life ladder information by, by cluster. Yeah, and then we see we see this here. Yeah, so now we have all, all the countries. Again, maybe we see some some, some outliers or, or interesting countries, but looking at the box plots, and these are the the happy ones, the winners, the, the pink group. And you see that the cluster grouping really makes sense. So these 20 groups, yeah, really seem to have countries which belong together also on the life ladder um, overall response from this survey. <clears throat> and very short, just brief, the second clustering technique that's k-means, especially useful if you have really large data sets, millions of um, observations. Yeah, here we have a sample data set. It's a bit modified for this demonstration, just 5,000 observations, but you can have millions and then k-means is still um, a good idea and um, very efficient. Yeah, and doing this, I just run the, that's, um, um, let me do this here, yeah. So doing this is also from the same menu, clustering, k-means, you set it up in the same way. And this result is, is analyzing um, attributes, properties of cells. Yeah? And here we have four of these attributes yeah? and we have cell measurement per row. And the problem is we have many, many rows, so we cannot calculate the distances between all of the observations. Um, so k-means is the alternative approach we could use. Um, and that's shown here. Yeah, you, you start by setting up a control panel. And here we said, let's check 6 to 15 clusters, these cases. Because for k means, we have to set up the number of clusters in advance. Uh, and we, we were not sure what's, what's the best one. And 11 seems to be the winner. So here the comparison tells us the optimum is 11 clusters. The CCC, that's um, the cubic clustering criterion. And this is maximum with 11 clusters. And then we can go down here and then we see the information for this output. We also have a biplot in 3D. And interestingly, just to show um, this in just three dimensions, it's shown in the principal component space. Yeah, so to show us where the variation is happening and what's going on in our data, the most informative way is to use principal components. It's not used for the calculations in this k-means clustering method, but for visualization purpose purposes, it also helps. Uh, and there are also other ways to, um, to visualize um, there's so parallel chord plots, for instance. So here we see the profiles yeah, for each group. And then you see the characteristics for the different groups and which attributes are high or low on average. 
at a different at a certain cluster, one of these eleven. Yeah, and same exercise at the end. If you want to use this information for further analyses, just save the clusters to the data table. And in this case, K means we get the cluster again plus the distance, the distance information. You can explore the resources we provide for teaching clustering. There's a one page guide in the learning library. The case study I already showed you, we also have an enhanced data set. Um, another webinar from last year, um, even providing more information and also some teaching tips for teaching clustering, uh, an academic webinar, and of course, the documentation. Many other methods we did not touch today. They are also provided by Jump and Jump Pro. And because the Jump Student Edition has all the capabilities of Jump and Jump Pro, you can do everything what we saw today. Um, and also what's listed here, including generalized regression, functional data explorer, with functional principal components. You can do everything in our new product, Jump Student Edition. That's the new Jump license for academic users. Yeah, it's available for free at jump.com slash student. Yeah. So faculty members, academic researchers, and students who are enrolled at a degree granting institution or university typically or high school can get free access to Jump Student Edition being covered for 12 months. And the software can be renewed if you are still um, academic, that's no problem. So if you were not aware that this is available, this is the pointer jump.com slash student. I also have the landing page here. So this is where you get to. Um, it also explains what you would get, the capabilities again, and then you get a button to get Jump Student Edition for free. And also all your students, of course, last but not least, can get this uh, license for free. And that's the, the end of my presentation today. Um, and I'm here to answer any questions, if there are any, Kevin. And I'm addressing some of the last ones here. So those who have questions, just hang on for a little bit. I'm going to try to address them by writing. If not, we can chat, but hang on. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for, for attending. As I mentioned, we will publish the recording of this webinar in the user community. Um, and you will get a follow-up email also with a link to that recording when available. Uh, you can also get the journal you have to open the journal in Jump, but that shouldn't be a problem anymore because if you are not covered, if you don't have Jump yet, you can get it for free if you are academic. And then you can open the journal, you can use the links um, and also the data which are embedded in this journal. So just by clicking a button, the data set or the data sets I use today open up and you can explore them yourself.